Well, good morning, Clearwater. Uh, my name is Kevin Taylor. I'm the high school pastor at First Baptist Naples, CC alumni, and uh, it's good to be back with you. I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm going to love the fact that I'm here because I'm loud. Um, but you know what? I've learned something. Life's too short. Hell's really hot. And our mission is too important for us not to be passionate about the gospel. That's what we're here for. And, um, you know, I, I know what you're facing right now. As, as I talked to a few of our students this morning, I know right now you're getting totally stacked up with those syllabus are coming in. You're looking at them. You're looking at all the stuff that you've got to do this semester. And Sarah used to joke, because we actually met at this time of our freshman year um, that we really started dating. During, they used to do winterums here, um, which were in between the two semesters. You could, you could take a couple week class. I took English 102, don't recommend that. Um, during a, I had to write a giant paper, but it was because of that I met Sarah because she was an English major and she helped me get that paper done. Praise Jesus. And ever since she's helped me with a lot of papers. But um, you know what? She used to say, at the beginning of every semester, I thought you were going to break up with me. And I'm like, why? She goes, because you would just get quiet and you would like pull back. And she goes, then I came to the realization you were just overwhelmed with all the papers and the books and the tests and everything that was coming. And you would get out of the funk in a week or two. And uh, she goes, you know, after four years of college, I figured that out. And uh, so I know right now for some of you, you're, you're just feeling that you're, you're getting stacked on. And let me tell you, what God brings you to, he'll bring you through. Hang in there. All right. That's why you got a whole semester to get it done. But hey, don't procrastinate to the last day. I know I say that and we all still do it, but uh, get after it now. Right. Well, listen, uh, this morning, I'm really excited to get to be here and talk about the glory of God in the gospel. And um, I think if we would all think back for a little bit, um, we could all think of a, a hero that we had as a kid. All right, I want you to think with me about that hero, and I'm going to see if my slides will get going with us. Um, I want you to think of that hero that when you're a kid, now don't Jesus juke me, okay, because I think all of us that grew up, like Jesus is, is our superhero, okay, and don't parent juke me and go, my daddy, all right, I want you to think of someone else other than Jesus and your daddy, okay, that when you were growing up as a kid, that you just, maybe you even had a poster on your wall, with that person, okay? Hopefully they were clothed well. But anyways, um, I want you to think about that hero, okay? For me, I remember as a fifth grader, sixth grader, um, I went to a, a Christian school that was attached to a church, and um, when I wasn't in ball, we would have to stay after school until my mom or my dad got off work to come pick us up. I still to this day can't believe the freedom that we had for about an hour after school until my parents came. Like that church, it was Thomas Road Baptist Church, and like we used to get in so much trouble for playing hide and go seek in a 5,000 seat sanctuary. Do you know how fun that is to play hide and go seek? Up until the security sees you. But anyways, we used to have a lot of fun. One of the things we loved to do was we would get a nickel or dime from all of our friends throughout the day. You just kind of watch the kid that would roll up there and buy all the stuff on the food line. You'd be like, hey, you got 10 cents I could borrow? And, and we would try, me and my group of friends would try to get up at least 50 cents in our pocket because as soon as school was over, and I still to this day, I don't know if my mom knows this, but we would run from the school all the way down to this little mom and pop convenience store. Like today, like creepers would totally steal you. Like you couldn't do that today, but I'm getting old and it was safe -er back then. And uh, we would run down to this little convenience store all because we wanted to get a pack of ball cards. And, and, and it was on because they had these little basketball cards and we all loved basketball at the time. Because there was one dude that if you pulled this dude out of the pack of cards, you were the man for the day. Michael Jordan. All right. Michael Jordan was, was one of my big childhood heroes. Um, my mom used to joke, we never have to paint your bedroom because you can't see it. You got so many posters of that guy. Because he would posterize everybody and dunk on him and everything. You know um, what was sad, and you know how those stories go around and Facebook, you can always see stories about things. I read an article from the Gospel Coalition um, about Michael Jordan. And it was really interesting because Michael Jordan just turned 50 years old back in February of 13. And uh, yes, we're in 14 now, so he's almost 51. 
But um, he got interviewed about being 50. Now, Michael Jordan um, was probably, um, and, and I don't care what people say uh, about LeBron today, um, and Jay would still school him. But uh, this is Michael Jordan's, uh, Michael Jordan's house that's for sale in Chicago, Illinois. You can actually pick this up. It actually went on the market for 29 million. Now it's just a cool 16 million because nobody would buy it for 29 million. You can actually go on a realty website and you can take a virtual tour. I did. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's sick, okay? It's just sick. This dude, Michael Jordan, 50, almost one years old, okay? Um, you can see all of his six NBA titles. LeBron, come talk to us when you do that. Um, Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player ever. I'll go ahead and just say that again. Um, he makes, still to this day, between 60 and 80 million just off from his Nike shoes. His, the, the, the Jordan, the Air Jordan. He makes that every year. He has a net worth right now of somewhere around 650 million, you know. I keep trying to convince Nike, you can put my silhouette on a shoe and I'll just take 1 million. You don't have to pay me 60 to 80, but I don't think we'll sell any. But listen, this guy knows what success is. And literally, if you ever watched him play, he was probably the most focused and determined athlete uh, when it came to the game of basketball. But what is really interesting, as I read this article and as, a, as one of my childhood heroes, and to hear him say this, I'm just crying out going, Michael, you need to pour your life into something more than temporal basketball. And, and he said this at, when he was inducted into the <clears throat> Hall of Fame. He made a couple of statements. And I want to read them to you. Jordan called the game of basketball his refuge, the place where I've gone when I needed to find comfort and peace. And now he's restless. Because what he had poured into the temporal is not there. He says, and he makes this statement, how can I enjoy the next 20 years without so much of this consuming me, he pondered. How can I find peace away from the game of basketball? And if you followed Michael Jordan all, you know he manages an NBA team. You know he's got a lot of endeavors here and there. But Michael Jordan, still to this day, he, he says, I, I'm searching for something more. There must be something more. And I'm here to tell you, when we pour in our vest our lives into temporal things, we will always come up in the end lacking. And young people, the worst thing that could happen is for you to come to a great school and get trained and, and jump into a career that you want to you wanna pursue temporal and fading things. And then one day when you're 50, go, I can't find peace. Because when it's all said and done, when we invest in the gospel and we invest in the glory of God, listen, we will never come up scratching our head going, what is it all about? Because that's about eternity. And eternity matters. And honestly, as I read this article, there was a little bit of the little 12-year-old in me that cried out for Michael Jordan. Going, Michael, do you understand? You're one of the most... Inf he talks about how he doesn't understand what it is to not walk in a room and be the most important person. And I'm here to tell you, the most important person in this room is not Michael Jordan. It's Jesus Christ. And today, I want to quickly... I want to look at three individuals in scripture that all have kind of a common thread three different people that had similar purposes we got to move quick i want to just glance off give you some practical ideas and i want us to see the thread of all three of these okay the first guy i want to look at is an egyptian pharaoh there is a nugget of a of a little passage of scripture back here in the middle of the ten plagues that, that I just love. Matter of fact, we have a creative arts team with our high schoolers called Resonate. This is our theme verse in Exodus 9.16. Because I love this little verse that's tucked away describing Pharaoh. And listen, if we were designed and built and created and placed on this earth to bring God glory, I want you to see today how God uses three different individuals all for his glory. We're starting with this Egyptian Pharaoh. Got your Bibles, look at Exodus 9 and verse 16. It says this, now listen, this is about at plague 6. And y'all remember, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, oh, let my people go. No, you know what I mean? You remember that whole battle going back and forth? And we're up to, we're up to plague 6, and Pharaoh is still playing games with God. Like, listen, you think you test God's patience? 
Can you imagine what this dude has done? You know when we sing those songs, your mercy endures forever? It's a good thing. Because Pharaoh deserved to be roadkill at this point. And God has continued to allow him. And I want you to see why God has allowed him to remain. Exodus 9, 16. For indeed, for this reason I have allowed you to remain, O Pharaoh, in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Did y'all catch that? Why God allowed a wicked Pharaoh to continue to play games with his chosen people was to show his power and to proclaim his name throughout all the earth. Now listen, let me beg of you of this. Some of you here might go, hey, I've messed up. I've done stupid things. How can God use me? I got news for you. If God can use a wicked Pharaoh to show his power and to proclaim his name, God can use you and I. Right here in scripture, we, say, we see very clearly the role and why God allowed Pharaoh to play these games with the children of Israel, to show his power and to proclaim his name throughout the earth. I want you to look at verse 17. Still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. You see, it all comes down to the pride issue, guys. Do you know why we're not going to live and proclaim the gospel? Our own pride. Pharaoh had a pride problem. It was all about him. And what these people were going to build, his little pyramids and temples and all this, it was about Pharaoh. And what I'm afraid of here, Clearwater, if we're not careful, when we come to our college time and we're getting trained, it's real easy for us to make it all about us. It's real easy. Well, it's all about me and how I need to get ready. And I want to be on part of this team because I want to be able to brag and go, well, I played baseball in college. Yeah, big deal. If it's all about you, that is fleeting. There used to be a, a, a myth, rumor, story that when Roman empires would return back after a great victory, that they would actually place a slave on the back of their chariot who would repeatedly say, all fame is fleeting. All fame is fleeting. So that they would remain humble in their victory. Guys, I'm here to tell you, just like Michael Jordan struggles at the age of 50 of, I can't find peace, it's because Michael Jordan's life has been about Michael Jordan and not about the gospel. God forbid that we make our lives about us and not about showing his power and proclaiming his name throughout the earth, the Egyptian Pharaoh. Next dude I want to talk about, flip over to John chapter 9. <clears throat> the blind man of John 9. Now, I added this dude into the mix after my pastor this weekend, flat out, he ripped John 9 apart. And I'm like, there it is again, another dude. And, and honestly, if we had time, we could, we could have more than just three dudes on this list that we're going to see the thread of the glory of God in, okay? Because it's the Bible. But I want to show you these three. And John 9, after my pastor preached a message, and I'm just like, holy mackerel, that's why this dude is blind, to show God's glory. In John chapter 9, you see this in verse 1. It says this, As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Hey, side note, bonus material here. Why are we so judgmental at people? Now listen, this wasn't the Pharisees who were classic at it. This was his own disciples that see a blind man there and they immediately jump to the conclusion, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, we understand that disease, sickness, and all that is part of the fall. It's the sin nature that, that came into this earth. But in this specific situation, this isn't a sin issue. This is a glory thing. And right here, the disciples jump to the conclusion when they see this hurting man, when they see this blind man, who sinned? And I think we've got to be careful in Christianity today that when we see hurting people, we don't just jump on them and go, what'd you do wrong? What'd you do? We need to extend a hand of grace and mercy and healing and not just throw them out of you sinner. Because God's got a plan for that sinner. 
And I want you to see that right here in John chapter 9. And, and the disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned? Verse 3, Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Did y'all catch that? This dude wasn't blind from birth because of sin or his parents' sin. It was because the works of God might be displayed in him. I want you to think about this with me. When it comes to this idea of our flaws, we all have issues. There's nobody perfect in this room. There's only one. He went to the cross for us. All of us in here have things and challenges. We all have a story. I got to bring one of our 11th grade guys up with me um, who's interning with me right now. And the whole way up, he, he, he asked me, PK, how'd you get called into ministry? And like an hour later, I'm like, dude, did you want all that? And he's like, yeah, I love hearing stories of how God worked. And I went, tell me your story. I'm not you, but we all have stories of how God works in our life, how God uses unique challenges and, and difficulties. And listen, I'm here to tell you, your dents are for his glory. Your difficulties, the things that maybe you're saying, this is holding me back, that can be your defining ministry, if you'll allow it. And right here we see, Jesus says in verse 3, this is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now listen what verse 4 says. We must work the work of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. I just put this side note in here, letter C. Do God's work now. Jesus is saying, hey, it's daytime. It's time for me to be about God's business because night is coming. And hey, I remember being there as a church ministries major, studying to go into ministry. And you know, you can get self-absorbed. Remember that pride thing? You'd be like, it's all about my degree. It's all about my grades. It's all about me, me, me. I'm going to tell you, the greatest thing that you can do to challenge yourself spiritually is serve God now. One of the greatest ministries that I enjoyed was I was the wanted game director at our church at Starkey Road. I love that. I love working with kids. And hey, newsflash, that's also where I really got to know Sarah. And I'm here to tell you bonus material, and I might have said this to you when it was October because it's, it's just important. You really want to meet a guy or a girl who loves Jesus? Meet them serving Jesus. Don't meet some dude that's smooth and he can say all the words, but he got no go behind all that talk. You want to find a guy who can be a man that will lead your family? Is he serving Jesus now? Don't let him tell you all the things he wants to do. What's he doing now? Serve God now. While it's day. I got news for you. The kingdom of God may come back before you graduate from Clearwater. And you don't get a pass just because you look at God and go, Well, God, I didn't get my degree yet. Sorry. Okay. Serve God now. Serve Him now. Because when you are pouring your life out for the gospel, it is probably one of the most inspiring growth. Just, it's like the nitros, nitros to your spiritual walk. It's the Red Bull. When you put your faith into action, there's something that puts you out there. Man, I love our college kids. Man, there's a bunch of them coming back to help us with a big retreat next weekend. You know why? Because the world says college kids just want to party, drink, have sex, and mess around. And I love it when there's college kids who go, no, we're going to burn bright for Christ. Man, I got a summer. I'm going to go serve at a camp. I'm going to go on a missions trip. I'm going to serve God now. Serve him while it's still light. Because there's a day when the hay's in the barn. And we don't have a chance to serve anymore. That's what he says in verse 4. Look at verse 5. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Hey, are you light? You see, because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ in the room, you're, you're that word called Christian, which means you're to be Christ-like. And if Jesus says, hey, I am the light of the world, I got news for you. That's our job as well. We are the light of the world to show God's power and to show his glory and to proclaim his name throughout the earth. 
I love it when I hear students go, man, I, I'm going to go to this trip. I'm going to go to China. Man, one of our college guys a couple years ago, he went with some missionaries. He backpacked for 45 days through the backwoods of Vietnam. Could have died, okay, for the gospel. He's one of my heroes. Like, sometimes, don't you just want a chance to die for Jesus? We live so safe, guys. And we sit there and go because we think of the temporal but we're serving all eternity. Serve him now. Be the light of the world. The blind man wasn't sin. It was to show God's glory. Last guy. Number three, a dead man. John 11. Just flip your page in your Bible. John 11, Lazarus. Jesus loved him. Loved his sisters, Mary and Martha. Y'all know the story, so we can go quick. I want you to see a couple verses. Lazarus is sick. That's what verse 2 tells us. Verse 3, so his sister sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, to whom you love is sick. Hey, don't ever forget this. God loves you. Don't ever forget that. Like sometimes we can sit there and get to a point where we feel like God's just out. He's just mad at me because I keep sinning. I keep messing up. And I want you to know it's because of his great love that we live and we breathe and we have our existence. The one that you love is sick, verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death. Get this, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Lazarus' sickness, which we know was a little quasi-death, okay? Um, it was for the glory of God. Y'all, when you see this passage, I think we can learn a couple of things about us. Because Mary and Martha give us a great portrayal of us. You know what happens? Jesus is doing ministry somewhere else. His disciples are like, dude, if you go back there, they're going to kill you like you can't do this. And Jesus is doing ministry. And listen, I'm here to tell you something. This is all about timing. I want you to look down. Uh, Jesus has stayed a couple more days doing ministry before he goes back. Verse 14. So Jesus then said to them plainly, because he had just said, hey, we need to get going back. Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples are like, don't. Will somebody wake him up? You know what I mean? Like somebody hit the alarm. And in verse 14, Jesus gives one of those things like, are these people ever going to get this? And he just plainly says, Lazarus is dead, y'all. He's dead. Okay, he didn't say y'all. He's dead. Okay, <laughs> Lazarus is dead. Plain and simple. And I am glad that for your sakes, did y'all hear this? And I am glad that for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Do you know that's the point of the glory of God? So that we may believe in him. So they head back. Check it out. Keep rolling on. Verse 20. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. And Mary stayed at the house. And Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here. How many times have we made that statement? God, where are you? God, if you would have showed up, this wouldn't happen. I'm here to tell you, it shows our humanity. Guys, we want things in our time, in our way. And we serve a God of our universe that doesn't play by our rules. He doesn't play by our games. Isaiah recorded, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Martha is going off on Jesus. Mary, both of them, go up going, Jesus, where were you? If you came, he would not have died. But even in that moment where they're shaking their fist at God, kind of, at Jesus, think about, Lord, we know that you can do whatever you wish. You see down there, verse 32, Mary comes out, says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Hey, verse 35, y'all want to learn a verse today? I know since middle school y'all have learned this verse. John eleven thirty-five. 35. Somebody quote it for me? Jesus wept. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's the one we always pull. And somebody quote me a verse, John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. People will say right here in this verse, you know, commentators often wonder, why did he cry? Why did he weep? 
Was it because he was broken over Lazarus being dead? I'm sure he was sad that was someone he loved, but he knew the end of the story. Like he knows the end of your story and he knows the end of my story. Listen, but I really think Jesus wept because of the lack of faith of his closest and beloved. I wonder how many times does Jesus weep because we don't get it, y'all. We don't get it. We don't get what he's trying to do and we want things our way. And he just says, man, chill out. I'm working for my glory and not yours. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Now, you guys know the end of the, uh, end of the story? Jesus goes over, cracks it open, Lazarus come forth. You know, Lazarus comes out, they got to get all the junk off him. He's alive. Therefore, verse 45, many of the Jews who came to Mary saw that he had, what he had done, and they believed in him. Listen, the reason why we must show his glory to a lost and dying world is not for our glory, so that they might believe in him and for his glory. That's why we are here. That's why we've been placed. Three dudes, a pharaoh, a blind man, and a dead man. All were used for the glory of God so that we might believe. Now, as we shut this thing down, similar threads... All three were uniquely used to bring glory to God and testify of his amazing power. How can I focus myself the most to bring glory to God this year? New year, new semester. Got to love that. Grades are clear. Don't mess this one up. But listen, how can you focus in 2014, spring semester, Clearwater Christian College, number one, remember your dents are valuable. From a great philosopher... Tomater. I have three kids, 10 and under, okay? Yes, I make a lot of cartoon illustrations. It's my life. Cars 2, you know you've seen it because it's good. Cars 2, there's this moment when Mater is getting outfitted for his spy gear. And uh, what is it? Holly Schiffwell, I think, is the secret agent. And she's trying to buff Mater up. And y'all know he's the old rusty tow truck. He's got dents. She's like, Mater, we got to move this dent. And... And he makes this statement. You can't touch my dents, says Mater. I got every one of them dents with my best buddy, Lightning McQueen. And she responds back, so your dents are valuable. Listen, remember this. Your dents are valuable. Those things that you might feel are your greatest chains in your life can become your greatest victories if you give them to the glory of God. Tuesday night I came home, like we are in just crazy zone right now, getting ready for our big student conference. And I came home Tuesday night, we got the kids to bed, and, I, and I'm laying there trying to, I'm sitting in our chair and I'm trying to like talk to Sarah, and next thing I know I'm in La La Land. And I remember seeing this image. At about 11 o'clock, I remember seeing my wife get up from the couch with her phone in her hand and go into the bedroom. And I was like, all right, is everybody okay? Because as a student pastor, we get some late night calls. And so about an hour later, Sarah came back out. I could tell she'd been been crying. I said, what was that all about? She said, that was Miss Julie. I said, Miss Julie? I'm trying to think, who in our ministry is a Miss Julie? And I'm like, she goes, you remember Andy's kindergarten teacher? I'm like, yeah, four years ago. He loved her. He goes, yeah, she just got diagnosed with breast cancer. The same one that I had. And so I saw it on Facebook, and I reached out to her and just said, if you want to talk, I'm here. For an hour, my wife was able to lean in to a lady who was about scared to death about what she's going to have to walk through. And hear that same journey that God took us through, God's using it to bring glory and to comfort another believer in Christ. Your dents are valuable. They do not have to define you, but they can sure bring glory to him. Remember that. I'm crying and there's a picture of Mater on the wall. What in the world? (laughs) This is jacked up. (laughs) Listen, number two, we got to ask big questions. You got to ask big questions about your life. You are not here just to get a degree 
from Clearwater Christian College. You got to make sure you're asking the big questions. I got some heroes in my life, guys that I just look up to. Dr. J from Student Leadership University, Dr. J Strax, one of my heroes, he's a guru on leadership. And he always makes that statement, which is actually at the bottom, begin with the end in mind. What's your end? You see, if your end is anything other than bring glory to God, you need to check your beginning. You are not here to get a degree, to go make money, live in a fat house, drive a nice car. You are here for the glory of God. That is why we are here. And we've got to ask those big questions. What is the story I'm writing with my life? I was walking around campus this morning and you know that old cliche, you never know what you got till it's gone. I did appreciate Clearwater when I was here. I knew the value of sitting under a, a Bob Carver, a Ken Davies, some of these teachers that were just pouring it into us. As I walked this campus, I went, how many of you today don't appreciate the fact that your story is being written here at Clearwater Christian College? Hey, Regardless of the circumstance of the situation of how you got here, you are here. Be here for the glory of God. Last thing, remember what we're here for. There's two verses. I drill these at my students all the time. So I'm going to drill them at you guys because. 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, not yours, his that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You and I are not our own. We are bought with a price. We are his possession. And our role, our job, our focus should be to proclaim the excellencies of the greatness of him who called us out of darkness and into light. Second one. It's on the same. Second Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors of reconciliation to bring glory to God so that all might believe. What are you going to do this year? We all have one life to live. Let's make sure that the story that we're writing is one that brings glory to God and proclaims his name and fame throughout the earth. Bottom line, we know, we know what we're here for. Are we going to be obedient? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for these guys and girls. God, I thank you for, um, I thank you for this place. I thank you for Dr. Clem and his heartbeat for the gospel. Because honestly, God, there is nothing that matters and is more important than the glory of God of the gospel. God, I just pray that you would help us. Instead of looking at our past and our dents, Lord, may we turn them into glory moments that we can use them for your glory. And God, I pray that you would help us to think about the life that we're writing. Is it about me or is it about you and your glory? Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.